for the kind invitation to give a talk here in this interesting meeting and in this really beautiful place. Thank you very much. Uh, so in my lecture today, uh, I would like to present you some new spectral bounds uh, for operators, non self adjoint operators, associated with some abstract second-order Cauchy problems. So the equations that we will look at are uh, second order in time equations, differential equations in a Hilbert space H. And our coefficients, uh, let's start with A0. Uh, A0 is an unbounded self-adjoint operator and we assume it's uniformly positive. D, the so-called damping operator, we assume to be accretive. And the special thing here is it is allowed to be equally strong as A0. This is expressed by this uh, boundedness condition here. So we'll come back to that a little bit later. Now, as usual, if you linearize such a second order differential equation in time, then you arrive at a first order system, um, as you can see it here. Uh, now the coefficient a will act in a product space. Uh, more precisely, the A is formally given by such a matrix uh, here. And uh, in order to make it more symmetric between these two corners, we consider this A in a Hilbert space consisting of the first component H1 half times the original space H, where H1 half is the domain of the square root of A0 equipped with the graph norm. Now, in this space, the domain of this operator A is, so to say, the maximal domain, which means it consists of all elements so that A applied to this element still is in the space. In this case, this means that not only the first component, but because of the identity here, also the second component needs to lie in H1 half. And this combination A0x1 plus dx2 needs to lie in the Hilbert space. Uh, maybe one remark, um, um, note that in this uh, matrix here, all entries are unbounded. Also the identity, because it has to be considered as an operator from H to H1 half, so it's not everywhere defined. And more importantly, um, this operator is not an operator matrix. I'll come back to that a little bit later. The reason is this coupling condition here in the domain. Now, the aim of my talk is to uh, analyze the spectral properties of this operator A uh, in terms of the damping <coughs> operator D. But before we continue along this uh, abstract uh, setting, let me, uh, to start with, give you an idea to which sort of applications uh, our results uh, would apply. So, for example, let's have a look at a wave equation with strong damping or in more mechanical terms with so-called viscoelastic and frictional damping. So, in this case, the A0 is uh, minus Laplace, eventually plus some function B, and now the damping consists of two parts. The viscoelastic part is proportional to the minus Laplace. And then there is this function V, which models the frictional damping. Uh, we can consider this equation either on all of Rn or on a bounded subset of Rn, in this case with C2 boundary. Now, let's uh, see what we have to suppose for these uh, coefficients here so that our assumptions are satisfied. The first uh, thing we have to assume is that this constant d here is non-negative because this operator needs to be accretive. Uh, this is the viscoelastic damping constant. Then the b, okay, we assume it to be bounded, 
but uh, then we have to ensure that A0 becomes uniformly positive. Uh, then of, in the bounded case, it's enough if this is non-negative, but if omega is Rn, the essential in fume needs to be positive. Uh, now about the V, the frictional damping. Again, to make this uh, accretive, the essential infimum of the real part has to be non-negative. And now we have to uh, ensure that this uh, condition, which maybe I'll put here, the A0 minus one half, D A0 minus one half, that this operator is bounded. And this is guaranteed uh, by these uh, dimension dependent uh, conditions that you can see here. So this is known from the literature, you just find the right results. Uh, let's for example look at this case uh, that the dimension is greater than or equal to 5. In this case for example it's also sufficient to assume that V is in the weak LP with P greater or equal to n half plus L infinity. So in all these cases uh, what we get is that then Another way to express this condition is that the D, when considered as an operator from the space H1 half to its dual H minus 1 half, uh, that this is a bounded operator. That is guaranteed by this condition. In this case, these two spaces uh, are uh, just Sobolev spaces, H0, 1 for H1 half, and this is the Sobolev space of order minus one. <coughs> now, yeah? Why do we exclude omega unbounded different from the Euclidean square? Uh, no particular reason. No, no it's reason. just an example. Yeah, no particular reason. Um, we've seen this already in several talks before, a classical tool to enclose the spectra of uh, non-self-adjoint operators is the numerical range. So here it is again uh, in a Hilbert space. We have an unbounded operator. So we need to take all scalar products uh, where x is in the domain and normalized. Uh, maybe it has not yet been mentioned. Uh, one of the most famous properties of the numerical range the, due to the turplitz hausdorff theorem, it's always a convex subset of C. And most importantly, it has the so-called spectral inclusion property. By this I mean that it contains all the eigenvalues and it contains the approximate point spectrum in its closure. So if you usually work with bounded operators, you might be a bit puzzled because here is not the entire spectrum, but in the unbounded case you need some additional conditions. Uh, you need to have in each of the at most two components of the complement of the closure of this numerical range, at least one point in the resolvent set. Then you get the enclosure for the whole spectrum. Although convexity seems to be a very strong and very nice property, it's really not so useful if you want to enclose spectra, especially if you want to get hold of some finer structures of the spectrum, not just that it lies in a half plane. A tool which uh, is more suitable in our situation is the not so new anymore quadratic numerical range. Uh, some of you may have seen this before. Uh, but let me stress that this is a concept which is defined for operator matrices. So this means that the uh, operator uh, in such a product of Hilbert spaces is such that also the domain respects this decomposition of the Hilbert space. This I will call an operator matrix. So what is then this quadratic numerical range? Let's first start here. So instead of taking a big scalar product in the whole space, we take component-wise scalar products with all the entries here. And uh, also another difference is that we individually normalize these two elements, x1 and x2. So they are not allowed to be zero. They have to have norm one. Uh, then you arrive at a two by two matrix. You take all the, well, the two eigenvalues and the union over all these eigenvalues is called the quadratic numerical range of this A0. 
well, this uh, quadratic numerical range can have uh, very nice shapes. Um, I have uh, put some of them here also to illustrate the following well-known properties of the quadratic numerical range. So this is an example for four by four matrices divided in two by two blocks. It is elementary to see that the quadratic numerical range is always contained in the numerical range. It is no longer convex because it is a union of uh, solutions of quadratic equations rather than linear as for the numerical range. So it may have at most two components. And as you see from, for example, this picture here, even these components need not be convex. Okay, because of this inclusion, it's a natural question to ask, does this set also have the spectral inclusion property? Uh, it's also elementary to see that uh, for every operator matrix, it always contains the eigenvalues. In these pictures, these are these gray, grayish dots here. It's a bit more involved with the approximate point spectrum. <clears throat> Actually, so far, uh, the enclosure of the approximate point, point spectrum in the closure of the numerical, uh, quadratic numerical range uh, was proved only for diagonally dominant and off-diagonally dominant operator matrices of order zero, which means the dominance really has to be strong in each of the columns. But it's not yet known for other situations like top or bottom dominant, and in particular, it's also not known if you don't have an operator matrix, because in the first place, the concept is not really defined then. So let's uh, see if we can uh, first generalize and then also take advantage of this quadratic numerical range in our particular situation. So the aim is really to characterize not only spectral bounds, but also to reflect more particular properties of the damping operator, such as uniform accretivity, sectoriality, or even self-adjointness uh, by using this quadratic numerical range. Now, it is known that uh, the problem with this domain is not so severe. Because actually A is not an operator matrix, but the closure of an operator matrix. You can show that uh, the domain of this operator A0 down here uh, is a core. And this restriction is then really an operator matrix. But still, it's neither diagonally dominant nor off-diagonally dominant, but bottom dominant. These are the dominating operators in each column. So the previous theorems just don't apply. Another property which was uh, known already for a long time and is also easy to check uh, in a few lines, uh, zero is always in the resolvent set. And the real part of the numerical range of A is, is, is always contained in the left, in the closed left half plane. Now the numerical range uh, of such an operator here always contains the numerical ranges of the diagonal elements, clearly. But because it's convex, it has to contain the convex hull of these numerical ranges. So in our case, it has to contain the convex hull of minus the numerical range of D and zero. So imagine this situation, you have a self-adjoint D even. Let me draw a picture. So you have a self-adjoint D, here is zero, and then somewhere, so it must contain zero, and then somewhere is the numerical range of D on the real, on this axis here. But since the numerical range is convex, it must contain everything in this convex hull. So it will always contain the negative axis. So you will never see a gap to the left of zero, even if D is uniformly accretive. You simply can't use it. So that's uh, one of these effects of the convexity of the numerical range. So let's see what we can do here uh, if we uh, uh, try to use the quadratic numerical range. 
So first we deal with equativity. So what does it mean? Uh, we will not only consider the equativity in the given Hilbert space, but also some refined measures which kind of involve also the operator A0. Now let me take you through these formulas here. So the equativity of D means that beta is greater or equal to zero. Because here we have the real part of D, here we have the original norm of H and that's the infimo. Now the other two quantities that we will need are mu and delta. They are different from the beta, just in the denominators. So here we replaced one such norm by the norm of uh, H one half and here even both factors. Now, because A0 was uh, uniformly positive, this is uh, the lower bound, uh, the, the, the semi-bound for A0. We have this inequality here between the two norms. And therefore, we get such a chain of inequalities between these constants here. A0 is always non non uh, strictly positive. And there is another inequality which we will use. Um, to see this, uh, you have to note that the square of this denominator here is the product of the two other denominators. So if you take the infima separately, you can get something possibly smaller. And this is why mu squared is greater than or equal to beta times delta. It's a simple inequality actually. Okay, so now we head for uniform equativity. This means that beta, this thing here, the beta has to be strictly positive. So beta greater than zero is uniformly equative. Now from these inequalities here, you see that any of the other conditions, delta greater than zero or mu greater than zero, both imply in this chain that beta is greater than zero. So Beta greater than zero is the weakest, the uniform activity, but we will sometimes assume more. Right? Now, uh, before we can start at all, uh, we first have to uh, get our main ingredient. We first have to prove the spectral inclusion theorem for this particular situation of a bottom dominant uh, operator matrix. And here it is. So the red part is this new result. So here is our operator, which is the closure of this uh, operator matrix A0, restricted to the core here. And we can show that both the point spectrum and the approximate point spectrum uh, are indeed contained in the closure of the quadratic numerical range of A0. Uh, note that we get the closure here uh, too, because we don't, our operator is not A0, it's the closure of A0. Right? And uh, then, of course, we know already that these two sets will be contained in the numerical range. So this uh, gives some hope that we have a new set here which might be smaller than, uh, at least in the matrix case, uh, it looked like that, that we have a chance. So let's see what we can do. I will now gradually uh, increase the assumptions on D. So we start with uniform equativity, where we already know we don't get anything with the numerical range. So here this is again, we will assume a bit more actually. Uh, we will assume that delta is greater than zero, this more refined uh, constant, which implies the uniform equativity. As I explained, you still see the picture on the blackboard. Uh, this is not, cannot be reflected in the numerical range because of the reason uh, you see there but it is reflected in the quadratic numerical range. Namely, uh, we can show that in this strip here, uh, between minus beta and zero to the left of the imaginary axis, we can estimate the imaginary part of any spectral point by this function here of the modulus of the real part. It involves these constants beta and delta, which are non-zero. Uh, we will see pictures a little bit later how these sets look like. Um, and it's even, it's, it gets even better. If it, by accident we even happen to have a situation where the product of beta and delta is greater than 4, then we can even show that there exists a spectral free strip. 
So this means the spectrum, actually it's a bit more than that, we can really show the spectrum uh, separates in two parts, to the left and to the right of this strip. And we can quantify this strip as you can see it here with this formula. It's centered at minus beta one half, this strip. So again, this is something you could never prove with a convex enclosure by the numerical range. And uh, keep in mind, this is still for the uniform accretivity uh, where we get nothing from the numerical range. So we've beaten it already once. So let's continue and assume a little bit more. Now we will assume that D is sectorial. So this means uh, that the numerical range of D is contained in some sector uh, of the, in this case, uh, right half plane. This K is some estimate here, uh, the, the sectorial, sectoriality constant. And in addition, we will keep this previous condition uh, that delta is greater than zero. In this case, the numerical range does give something. Namely, you can estimate the numerical range and obtain the following spectr really spectral enclosure. So the imaginary part of lambda is bounded by this term here, which comes from the sectoriality of D, plus some uh, square root term in mod lambda, a mod real part of lambda. Now, uh, unfortunately, this term here uh, prevents that you uh, ever get an enclosure in a sector. So although D was sectorial, uh, this A will never be sectorial by means of a, an enclosure through the numerical range. The numerical range cannot uh, yield this. Why? Um, maybe a not so much known th property of the numerical range is its corner property. Every corner of the numerical range is a spectral point. Sorry, if it's in the closure, it's a spectral point. If it's contained, it's even an eigenvalue. But in general, it could only be in the closure. Uh, so zero is not in the spectrum, so it can never be a corner of the numerical range. So you can never find an enclosure of the numerical range which has a corner at zero. It's impossible. The quadratic numerical range does not have this corner property. It has some corner property, but as we will see, the situation is different. Now, uh, in fact, with the quadratic numerical range, we can derive three different enclosures. And these different enclosures are for different cases. Uh, for example, the, the, the least we can assume is beta greater than zero. We can do nothing uh, there for the numerical range. Then we can assume a bit more than mu greater zero implies beta greater than zero. Again, we can't do anything with the numerical range. Only when we assume delta greater than zero, the numerical range gives something. What I show you here, this whole thing is already the optimal combination of all these results. So we figured out precisely where, which estimate is the best. <coughs> So let's uh, start and have a look. This estimate is to the left of the imaginary axis directly in some strip to the left, actually uh, down to minus beta one half. Now here we have the sectoriali sectoriality part from the, from the D and then you see this factor in front is a bit larger than one. So it gets a bit uh, larger than the original D was. The next one is easier to, uh, to figure out because k mu is just a constant depending on mu. So this is actually a sector. The second one is a sector. And this is valid in the entire half plane. The inclination or this, this constant k mu here is given by a complicated formula. Um, maybe important to know is only uh, it's greater than or equal to k, the original constant, so it opens a bit more compared to D. And we can also bound it from above by another quantity. Now the last estimate is not uh, so explicit, uh, okay. The H is a function which is the largest non-negative zero of this cubic equation. You can also figure out some estimates, but this is maybe not so important for the purpose of this talk. Um, but as I told you, that this is, uh, so to say, these are the optimal estimates in each uh, region. Uh, so, for example, this estimate uh, is, is uh, this one here, 
uh, is already a bit worse than this one directly to the left of the imaginary axis. But this is a sector, so this will even be sharper than a sector. And we will see it in the next slide, how it looks. Now we have one last step uh, left, even in the self-adjoint case. So again, we are better. Even in the self-adjoint case, we can beat the numerical range. So now let's assume that D is self-adjoint. This means up here that the K is zero. Right? And we keep again delta greater than zero. Actually, in this case, the difference between the numerical range and the quadratic numerical range is most dramatic, you could say. Uh, here are two cases where you can see this very well. Um, if mu is greater than or equal to zero, the spectrum is entirely real. The quadratic numerical range is entirely real and hence the spectrum. This is the logic. And if mu is less than two, uh, then still the non-real spectrum is bounded. But we can also show that the imaginary part of the numerical range is always unbounded. So that is quite uh, surprising. You think, OK, if D is very nice, maybe the, the, the numerical range gives more. OK, now let's have a look at these sets. Uh, it's a bit tiring to see all these formulas. And I will first, uh, I, I have uh, two uh, rows. The first one shows uh, sectorial D. The second one shows self-adjoint D. And from the left to the right, we will first start with uh, only this enclosure here throughout uh, the half plane, what it gives actually in this strip. And then we will go to this assumption delta greater than zero. It's explained on the next slide. So here in this strip, uh, down to minus beta half, even if we only assume that beta is greater than zero, um, we still get this enclosure here from the quadratic numerical range. And this grayish, or here it looks a little bit bluish, uh, set is the numerical range. It's just the half plane. It's not better than that. Um, so we are doing already much better, and we have a sharp corner here. Then, uh, this is now the optimal combination of the three estimates already. And again, we get this nice sharp corner. This is from here. Here is a linear estimate from the middle term, and then the final one. So this is when I assume even delta greater than zero. And in the last column, I have in addition, assume that this product is greater than 4. This is the illustration for the first theorem. In this case, the quadratic numerical range enclosure uh, shows this, uh, this gap. And hence, we know that the spectrum is separated in two parts. And this is the picture for the self-adjoint case, uh, self-adjoint D. So again, here only with beta greater than 0. Then it's even an interval in this strip here, the quadratic numerical range. From here on, it doesn't give anything if we leave that zero. Then comes this combination. Here is this bounded non-real spectrum. It's contained in a disk, actually. And this is the most extreme case here. In this case, uh, the quadratic numerical range is uh, just two intervals with a gap around minus beta half. And remember, uh, the numerical range, uh, you can see it here, it will tend to infinity if the real part tends to minus infinity. So it, mm -hmm. it is unbounded. Does it correspond the last picture to the phenomenon of overdentedness? Uh, yes, I think so. Well, I checked it actually. But the problem is this overdampness, um, there is unfortunately nothing for unbounded <laughs> coefficients as far as I know. Maybe you have something in your paper, but the original papers um, are for bounded coefficients only. But this condition, the 4 is not an accident. It's the same 4 as in the overdamping assumption. Yeah, that's true. OK, maybe one comment on this corner property. So why can this quadratic numerical range have a corner here? The theorem for the quadratic numerical range is the following. If you have uh, an operator matrix with entries A, B, C, and D, and you have a corner of the quadratic numerical range, then you have 
uh, not just one possibility, the corner can be an eigenvalue of A0 or a spectral point of A0, but it can also be an eigenvalue or spectral point of one of the diagonal elements. And one of our diagonal elements is zero, you see? And this is why it doesn't have to be a corner of the full operator, because we have this, this zero here, right? OK. So now, uh, on the last two slides, I would like to show you that uh, these results uh, can actually be made explicit if you apply them to some concrete applications. And here is one. Um, when you consider the small transverse oscillations of an ideal incompressible fluid in a pipe, then you arrive at such a second order Cauchy problem. So here is the second order in time, and here is the first order in time, these two terms here. We are on, a, on the interval 0, 1 here. So what are our operators? A0 uh, comes from here. Here is the, it's a fourth order differentiation times this constant coefficient e. And the damping, the first order derivatives in time, is this term here first and then this one. So it consists again of two parts. This part is proportional to the A0 and it would be self-adjoint, but this part here is not self-adjoint. In this case, you can work out all these constants, uh, beta, delta, and mu, precisely, because the problem has constant coefficients. Uh, and yet, you can also estimate the sectoriali sectoriality constant of this operator, uh, d, given by this quantity here. So we can apply all our available results, because all the constants are non-zero. And this is what we get. Now here are some particular values, of course, uh, these two for E and K. And now the interest is in, in the behavior with respect to C. So here you see a picture for C equal to 1. And if you would now uh, increase the C, then this part here becomes thinner and thinner. And here you see the critical point. It's just one point here. This is precisely the critical value. 10 over pi squared, which is roughly that number. And if you increase C further, then the spectrum splits into two parts. And here you see also the numerical range gives something. It's such a parabolic uh, set, but of course it's much larger. Uh, but at least it gives something. Now, um, this is of course maybe a bit uh, boring because all the coefficients are constant. Uh, but in general, you see you might not be able to compute these beta, delta, and so on precisely. So a more realistic example is maybe our first example with the wave equation. So, just, yeah? Can we just come back to the... To the yes. Uh, when you say uh, uh, transverse oscillations of either uh, are equal to fluid, is the pipe fixed yes. in this model? Yes. So it's only the fluid which is oscillating? Yes. I, 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 if I remember it correctly, yes. I have to say that I did not find another source for that problem. I, I searched quite a lot. This is the only reference that I know for that problem. Anyway, so maybe we can talk about it a bit later. So this is the wave equation uh, with uh, the damping we looked at before. Uh, here are the assumptions again. Of course, we want this term to be present, so D should even be strictly positive. Here is the assumption from the second slide. And for simplicity, I have now assumed that B is zero, so that A zero is just minus the Laplacian, and we consider the case, for example, that omega is bounded in Rn. In this case, we have the following information about these quantities that we need. So first of all, we need uh, the lower bound for, uh, for A0. Um, if the B is not there and we are on a bounded uh, subset, then this is just the smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian, usually called lambda 1 of omega. Now here are the definitions of the quantities beta and delta. That's the V on top, and then we have these different denominators here, the usual norm, and here Z1 half. Uh, squared in norm. Okay, so here you can't determine the infimum precisely, but you can estimate it. 
from the first, you get d times this first eigenvalue, and then you get the essential infimum of the real part of V uh, as another term. This is a lower bound for the quantity beta. And the same here, this is non-negative, so we are left with a D only, a lower bound for the delta. Now, what we know already, uh, so we haven't assumed any sectoriality, so the numerical range will always be the entire closed left half plane in this case. But, as we saw previously, the quadratic numerical range gives a non-trivial enclosure in this strip between minus beta and zero, real part between. And it gives a spectral free strip if this quantity, this product here is greater than four. Now, I'm also showing this example uh, because uh, you now need to know, in addition, that our results are monotonic in these constants. So they are optimal for the true infima. And they get a bit larger if you just have lower bounds. If the lower bounds approach the infima, they get better and better to these optimal ones. But you can work with any lower bound that you have. So in particular, if beta minus times delta minus is greater than four, then also this product will be greater than four. And from this condition, we can then work out some critical value for the damping. And well, it's expressed by all the quantities above. And the picture that we then get is the following. So, for example, uh, this is now a, a, an example for the unit uh, disk in R2. So we know precisely what this smallest eigenvalue is, zero of the Bessel function J0. Now this is for the case that the, this infimum here is indeed equal to zero. If D, for example, is 0 0.8, we are still below this critical D crit. And in this case, our enclosure has this shape, it has one component. If we go above D crit and 9 .0, 0 0.9 is such a value, then we already have uh, an enclosure which consists of two components. So in the second case, we can really assert that the spectrum of the original problem uh, separates into two parts which are contained in these two uh, regions here. Of course, it could have two components here too, but we can't prove it with this method. And no matter whether you have one or two components, in any case, uh, we are doing much better than the numerical range, which in both cases is the entire closed uh, half plane. So I think my time is uh, almost over and I would like to thank you very much for your attention.